my geographers. Gonna get into some new stuff today. Gonna get into this concept of biogeography. And specifically, we'll look at ecological biogeography. So looking at ecosystems, those little contained units of nature and how organisms interact with other organisms and interact with non-living components within that ecosystem and so on. All right, so we're going we're gonna to cover a bunch of, uh, it's a lot of uh, definitions and stuff like that, kind of nerdy, somewhat boring listings of this is what we call this and this is what we call that and, and so on. Yeah, but it's important to understand as we continue to talk about biogeography and get into talking about some of the other stuff. Like next time we'll get into evolution, which will be uh, connecting some of this stuff. And then the final lecture for the class will be on biomes, which is effectively it's putting pieces together and talking about ecosystems with more of a big picture uh, in mind. All right. So that's that's the idea here. And to start with, I also think it's important to um, discuss, well, like, we'll just talk about this picture that you're seeing on the screen right here. So this, I took this picture. This was years ago. This was uh, before professor days. I was working uh, as a map guy doing GIS stuff uh, for this wetland and waterfowl conservation operation. So their whole deal was to a small little uh, entity, it's a little non-profit thing, uh, that their, their whole mission was to increase wetland habitat, which wetland, I don't know if we've gotten into this in the, the class yet, but wetland's just a, a nice way of saying swamp, really. We used to call it a swamp, and we used to try to drain these swamps because we saw them as bad. Now we call them wetlands, and we realize that, oh, you know what, these are actually important. Right? They might smell funny from time to time. They might allow mosquitoes to grow, uh, but they're actually necessary for cleaning water and, and being a home for important members of ecosystems and, and all that stuff. All right, so that's the, the idea. And so, we yeah, we use the nice term wetland because that just sounds nicer and makes people want to conserve them. All right, so part of it was the conservation there of the actual habitat, and then the other side was waterfowl, meaning ducks and geese, right? These birds that live in these wetland habitats. So this picture was taken uh, when every now and then I got to go play with the biologists, right? When it was, I think, when it was clear that I was getting bored in the office just making maps to support these guys, I got to go out and play around. And this one day, uh, we're out catching ducks, and so this duck got this female mallard um, hanging right here. Don't worry. She's totally fine, uh, even though that's kind of a, an odd um, uh, position uh, right there. But what, what we did was we drove all around Northern California in this specific area. And you can see in the background here, there's that cage. That's this duck trap that was left out or for whatever waterfowl would actually work its way in there and it's the idea that the bird can get in but then it can't figure out how to get back out and so it just stays there and so this biologist Jim right here his job was all throughout the summer seven days a week he would drive around to check on these traps and he had to do it seven days a week because you can't leave these things in for you know a few days they would starve and die so in the summer months um, when these traps are out he's working constantly all right you got to be out there, and if a duck or a few ducks are in the trap, goes into it, get, you know, catches them, grabs them, pulls them out of the trap, uh, and then starts to, you know, weigh them, which is what's going on here. So this is a scale right there, and there's, you can kind of see, this metal band right here is something he put on, <clears throat> or I got to put on, on this day too, and then it had a serial number and, and all of that, uh, and so we way the duck can record all sorts of information what's the species and sex and you know overall health of the uh the bird uh and then once all that was recorded send the thing back out you know just let it go 
right? But it's got this band on it. And so the idea was, um, you know, we record where it's hanging out in the summer. But then in a few months, when duck season opens and people are out hunting ducks, if someone shoots this duck and they've got the band on there, they take the band off, turn it in to the Fish and Wildlife Service with the information of where this duck was shot. And then I would get the data later to be able to map where these birds are migrating, you know, from and, and to and all that. So they're summering in uh, Northern California, but then they're shot on the, the East Coast by some duck hunter in Virginia or wherever it, it happened to be, right? And so I would get the data and I would map this stuff out and it would go into just seeing to see how many ducks are moving through the area and to record that stuff. Incredibly morbid, right? To think that in order to save the animals, we're going to rely on killing them. Um, but that's the thing with hunting. It's, uh, if you're not a hunter, it of course sounds barbaric and awful, but it's actually, it's an important component of ecology. And I'll be getting into exactly what we mean by ecology and how, you know, hunting can be an important thing and, and all of that. But that's, that's what we need to be thinking about here. Not just, you know, biogeography specifically, um, ecology here, or evolution or whatever it is we're going to be talking about. It's not the same as like environmentalism, right? It's not the same as trying to just preserve everything and, and save everything. It's more about how things are interconnected. And in nature, that means we've got, you know, life as well as death. And what's really crazy too, uh, it's like, take this guy right here who's holding this duck, um, sweetest man in the world when it came time to catch the ducks. And by the way, if you've never caught a duck, oh, go out and do it. Homework assignment, go catch a duck. It's fantastic because they would freak out. They'd be flapping as you approach them like, oh my God, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. But as soon as you got close enough and you could grab them, they just gave up. They just go limp and they're like, okay, just make it quick. You know, you know I, I fought a good fight, but I can't fight no more. Uh, and, and it was just adorable. Um, it, it, these ducks were, were super adorable. Uh, and so Jim here, what he'd get the duck and he would just baby talk it, uh, you know, and gently stroke it and let it know that everything was going to be okay as he's doing all his sciencey stuff right here. Right. But what, what's also, what's crazy about this is that he was an avid duck hunter. And the, all these guys who were, I was the only person who worked here at this, this place that wasn't a duck hunter. Um, everybody else, all of these people who have dedicated their lives to, you know, making more ducks, uh, saving ducks and geese and, and all that stuff. They loved to blow the hell out of these things, you know, every fall. Right? That was, just, oh, that just got them so excited. So it was really, it was crazy as a non-duck hunter. To see these folks, but all these guys, and talking with all of them, they really, they respect the the species. They they really like ducks, but they also like you know entering into that ecosystem and and you know being the predator of this this species. And, and it's yeah, it's weird if you're not into it, but but it's it's important. And as I said, we'll we'll get in uh, uh, to that stuff. But it's also important to realize just how dark. Some of the ways in which we're studying this stuff, how that works too, right? Just to, to be aware of really what biologists are doing, or at least some of them are doing. We tend to think of, you know, elaborate GPS receivers and stuff you might see on the Discovery Channel where it looks very non-invasive. And yeah, there are people at big research universities doing that stuff. Well, that stuff's expensive. And if you already got people shooting ducks anyway, why not just put a really cheap little aluminum band on the duck uh, and, you know, win-win, right? Don't have to worry about sending off, you know, expensive computer stuff that you might never, ever see again, right? It's pretty ingenious ways of tracking this. All right, so this first term, biogeography, it's, I mean, it's pretty simple, right? Biology, geography, we're slapping them together, right? So, I mean, just think of it that way. But technically, we're doing some spatial analysis here. 
right? We're looking at where life is, okay? And, and so in doing that, in looking at the where, not just how, you know, cells are dividing, organisms are reproducing, how they're surviving in an ecosystem and all that, um, instead of just looking at the organism itself, we're looking at that big picture, as we've done with everything in this class up until this point. We're looking at where stuff is taking place, right? So this concept, distribution patterns of organisms over space and time, right? What we're getting at, that's this whole idea of where stuff is, as well as when. That'll be important when we get into evolution and natural selection and, and all of that. All right, uh, and then we're getting into, you know, not just the where, but also how is this stuff working? Why is it happening? And, and so on. So that's where that's how we're blending geography and biology. These are questions like today, what we're going to really be dealing with, um, although with some of it, I'll just kind of gloss over in the interest of time. Uh, it's how do interconnected systems of the atmosphere, lithosphere and hydrosphere affect the biosphere. And these are concepts that I brought up a million years ago, back at the beginning of the uh, semester, one of those first lectures that you watched or listened to, uh, or whatever, we got into that idea, right? The atmosphere, the air around us, the lithosphere, that's the geology, right? The rocks around us, the, the material earth itself, the hydrosphere, you know, looking at water, how does this affect the living components of the planet? So we're going to get into that today. Uh, and then the second question, how did continental drift play a role in species evolution? So if you think back to uh, Wagner uh, and, and continental drift and Pangaea and all of that stuff, uh, just that movement of the continents um, that it, which led to isolation of specific species. We'll get into how that works next time, right? How, how the movement of, of the continents and therefore the movement of populations of organisms, how that led to evolution, which led to just species diversity and all this stuff that we'll cover next time. Okay? I'll also say, as you're listening to this, I don't know if I've mentioned this already either, it's all a blur. Um, but with evolution, if you're listening to this and you're hearing evolution and it's making you feel uncomfortable, um, and I know I, every single semester I have at least one student uh, who has been raised uh, to, to think that evolution is not okay, that it's either an, an outright lie or it's some kind of deception or something along those lines quite often for religious, you know, principles and, and based on that. If, if that's you, if you're listening to this and evolution is making you, you, you kind of turn off um, from all of this stuff, I encourage you um, to not bail, all right? And for if, well, A, um, because you're going to be tested on it, uh, right? And so you don't want to just, you know, shut off and, and uh, you know, miss all of this stuff and, and then you know, fail the test and, and have to take the class over again and, and all that. Like, it's just from a practical reason, it doesn't seem worth it. Uh, but also, I address this will when I, I give the lecture on evolution. And I spend some time talking about this, you know, really what we typically see here in the United States is this, this apparent conflict between Christianity uh, and, and Darwinian evolution. Yeah, and, and what I get at, spoiler alert, is there is no conflict whatsoever, really. <clears throat> and, you know, and, and I get into how, you know, both, you can be both, right? You can, you can believe in both a Christian God and uh, Darwinian evolution, and there's absolutely no hypocrisy there or anything like that. In fact, the majority around the world of people who identify as Christian um, are perfectly fine doing that. All right, so I'll get into that exact stuff, but I'll also let you know, um, as we're, we're getting into this stuff, like I'm, I'm going to make you write about evolution and natural selection and all that in that final exam we have for the class. So, you know, be warned, but also I'm not going to make you, uh, 
like swear off your your god right or your like your the final question is not like you know swear that there is no god and you know some awful thing like that not gonna do it uh, and I, I've, I've heard uh, there's at least a biology professor or two who uh, try to make you do that. I, I have no interest uh, in that. That's, that's, that's creepy as hell. Um, so just keep that in mind. In fact, one of the best students I've had in recent years, brilliant young woman doing you know very well in the stuff, attentive in class, doing great, um, going through on that last question um, where I had her talking about evolution, gave me this beautiful, beautiful, just definition after definition and explanation and everything was thorough, fantastic, 20 out of 20, clearly. And then the last sentence was, by the way, I forget exactly how she phrased it, but it was effectively like, by the way, this is all bullshit. Um, God is who created all of the organisms on the planet or, or something along those lines, right? Fantastic. Your belief and you know, this scientific theory and the evidence and all that, they could be totally separate things. She still got an A on that very well done essay, still got an A in the class, and she was able to maintain that, you know, authenticity of, of who she is, right? So just keep that in mind. I'm going to implore you to stick with this stuff, even if my constant reference to evolution is, is, is you know, putting up some warning bells for you. We'll get into it. We'll, we'll discuss it. But, you know, for nothing else, just go with it. Challenge yourself. Listen to this stuff. I'm not trying to convert anybody. Just say, again, it's one of those things, like, I don't, I mean, no offense, um, but I have no interest in converting you to anything other than being a geography major. That's, uh, I guess that. But that's, uh, that's for selfish reasons, right? Let's try to get good people into my program and steal them from, you know, English or psychology or whatever. Right? But when it comes to like, like converting your, your worldviews and stuff, uh, no, no, not gonna, not gonna do it. So just, you know, so just listen to the stuff. And if you hear it and you think, nope, I'm still steadfast in what I believe, fantastic. And if you go, hmm, I never thought of it that way, yeah, maybe I'll learn more. You know, fantastic. Right? But don't do what some students do, which is simply like refuse to listen to the evolution stuff, refuse to read the chapter, and then have your, you know, test suffer as a result. Does that make sense? All right, that's my little pep talk for you. Let's move on. Let's get into the good non-controversial uh, stuff. Uh, we'll just get into what ecology is. All right, so, ecology, I mean, I have this definition here. The study of relationships between organisms and their environment and among the various ecosystems in the biosphere. Great. Uh, that's that's true. Um, but I think a good way to think about it, the way the the way when I first read this, it kind of changed my perception of what's going on, uh, is that that eco, right, in ecology here, it's the same eco that we have in economics or economy, right? So it's really what we're looking at. It's the study of the economy of nature. What are things doing to survive, right? What are their jobs? What are they doing for a living out in nature? Okay? And when you think of it that way, I, think, I don't know, at least for me, that kind of made stuff clear, right? And exactly what an ecologist is doing. We're looking at these relationships. How does this bird interact with this other thing, right? This bush, uh, that grows in the same ecosystem, or this fish that lives in the same ecosystem, or the snake, or, or whatever, right? We're looking at these relationships. Again, think of it as, as an economics scenario, and that might help kind of clarify exactly what it is we're getting at here. Now, an ecosystem, it's a term we use, we throw out quite easily, but it's important to know what it is. We're simply, we're defining this little unit or like this region of organisms and the greater environment in which they're all interacting. Okay, so it's an area, and we can kind of clearly, we'll get into this more with biomes. That's where it's kind of easier to define this stuff. But we can typically, we can go 
anywhere, into the desert, into a forest, to the, the coast, top of a mountain, wherever. And what we're looking at is an ecosystem, right? We're looking at the plants, we're looking at the animals, we're looking at temperature stuff and water quantity as well as quality, the, you know, soil, uh, uh, just underlying bedrock in general. All of these different things make up an ecosystem because all of these things are interacting in one way or another with everything else within that ecosystem. Okay, uh, so we're looking at both, and I have a few, and don't worry about an open system here. Right? Really what this is getting into is that things from outside of the ecosystem can affect what happens inside the ecosystem. We'll see examples of that in a bit. Um, but, but two terms, biotic refers to the living things, and then abiotic refers to non living things. And I'm not meaning, it doesn't mean dead things. It means things that were never alive to begin with, right? So like looking at this picture right here, here, pop quiz, what kind of bird is that? Do you know, I don't know. Um, I, I think I just Googled water bird uh, and did an image search and pulled one that looked pleasant. Um, nice shades of green uh, in, in the back. I have no idea what kind of bird this is. Um, the, the, the bird. We're going to look at a lot of birds throughout here. I have no clue. One bird from the next. I ain't no biologist. Um, but still, we can say it's a water bird, right? Whatever crane or egret or whatever this, this thing is, um, it lives in a specific ecosystem, right? Which again, it's this wetland ecosystem where you can see it's standing in the water. These plants are growing up out of the water. And so if we're studying this organism, this whatever water bird this is, what we're also doing is we're looking at all the other stuff, the water, the plants, what's in the water, right? What is it eating? What is it doing to survive, right? And the ecosystem is a nice little unit where we can study all of this stuff. And of course, with ecosystems in general, this is, and we'll get into this again, we'll get more into it next time with the evolution stuff. But what we're looking at here is how organisms have adapted to survive, if not thrive, in a key ecosystem, right? Meaning that this bird, it is well suited for this specific ecosystem, right? That long bill right there, that's going to be, and the neck too, it's great for being able to reach down in here into the water and pull out a fish or whatever it is it's eating uh, in here, right? And the, you know, legs, I'm sure if we can see its feet spread out so it's able to walk through the, the muddy, um, you know, bottom of the, of the water in here. This thing just does well in this ecosystem. And it would be apparent, let's say you're on vacation to wherever, um, this thing is, is hanging out. Uh, and you see one of these, you're like, man, I'd like to take that home. And so you capture it and you bring it home to the Antelope Valley uh, and you just let it loose. Um, it's going to be dead in like two minutes, right? It's not going to work well. It, those, you know, feet and legs are going to be great in the water. Not so great on the rocky uh, desert ground. Uh, when it tries to catch like a lizard or whatever to eat it, it's just going to be clunky. It's not going to work because it's just, it hasn't had hundreds of thousands if not millions of years to evolve and adapt for this specific ecosystem and we'll get into uh, this idea of of the adaptation and therefore efficiency and, and things like that we'll we'll cover that right but that's that's another thing to think about now within these ecosystems we have what are called communities okay meaning we're, we're looking at these direct relationships okay plants and animals that are stuck together um food chains we'll we'll talk about that's kind of the easiest one to envision um so we'll spend more time on that but there's other stuff that i'll be covering but it's just how do plants animals as well as the abiotic stuff how do these things all directly interact with one another and the thing with ecosystems is it's not just one community. We'll have multiple communities. So there can be organisms that live in an ecosystem that never interact directly 
with one another. They might see each other, but they're not, you know, connected to what one of them eats or, or how it lives or its niche or, or any of this stuff that we, we get into. Okay? So that's what a community is. Okay? Now, habitat um, is one that is uh, kind of an obvious and important one. It's the specific place in which something is living. Okay, we've got this bird here. You guys know what kind of bird that is? Me neither. Again, Googling. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's some kind of sand bird, I guess. I don't know. Um, but you can see in looking at it, it's camouflaged, right? It's blending in. So if you weren't looking carefully, uh, and as long as it didn't move or make a noise or whatever, you could easily walk past this thing and not even know it's there, right? So clearly, its habitat is down there in the sand, on the ground where it's able to blend. And we can see that with other stuff. Um, you know, things just have that coloration. So it's able to hide and therefore survive, not be attacked by predators. I actually ran into, not one of these, um, but I was, I was taking my kids out bike riding, um, just some, like some abandoned lot um, not too far from my house. Uh, just, you know, in the dirt to take their mountain bikes out and, and play around and everything's fine until suddenly a bird just appears out of nowhere, seemingly, and starts screaming at us. Uh, and it was it wasn't this exact one, but it was very well camouflaged in just the, you know, kind of tan Antelope Valley soil that was out there. And as it popped up and was screaming, you could see it had like three eggs underneath it. So it was hanging out just in that area. That was its habitat. And specifically where it was, um, you know, reproducing, right? Able to, you know, have offspring survive and grow up and, and become mommy and daddy birds in the future. And of, and of course, you know, we, we left. We were, we were responsible. But it was, oh, it was really hard. I really wanted to get up close and take pictures for the class. But, you know, I didn't. I was, I was a good, good citizen. And, and, and just let that, that crazy mom bird just go back to sitting in the dirt on her eggs. Okay, so that's that's what we mean by habitat. Uh, now, niche, or, you know, niche is the way, if you want to sound like a French pretentious guy, you say it that way, but niche. Come on, we're Americans, damn it. Um, niche is another key thing, um, and, and we'll reveal communities in the uh, ecosystem. And this directly gets to that idea of an economy of nature. Okay, it's the... The niche, it's the job, right? What does this thing do for a living? It's occupation, right? So within this community. And so we find within ecosystems that, you know, organisms, they, they have something that they're doing. And it might not be as, you know, romantic as it, it sounds. It might not always be obvious, um, you know, what that thing is. It might just seem like, I don't know, it's a thing that's just there. But others, like I picked this bird because it's kind of an obvious one. And this is a bird I know, right? What is this thing that we're looking at? It's a vulture, right, of some kind. I'm, I'm sure it's, you know, a specific. I think this might be a turkey vulture like we have here uh, in California. Uh, I'm pretty sure. Don't quote me uh, on that. Um, but so with this, you know, this bird, it has a very clear, distinct job within a community, within a larger ecosystem, right? And what is that? What's the job of the vulture? Right, I, I, I assume you're shouting at me. Uh, it's it's going to eat dead stuff, right? That's what this thing does. And that's an important role because if we didn't have things like this, they're called detrivores, going around and eating dead stuff, the waste that's you know left behind in the ecosystem, the ecosystem would be pretty filthy and pretty gross. So it's good to have something that wants to eat this dead stuff. And again, we can see that with all of this, it's it's connected to evolution and natural selection and adaptation and passing on traits and all this stuff we'll, we'll get into. Because this bird, just looking at this bird's face, but you can see it just, it it works for this this job that it has, right? Like it's, you know, look at that bald face, right? You don't see big elaborate feathers and all that. Like if we go back here, you know, this bird, same feathers on the face, 
right, to help it blend in and all that. But these things are so distinct, and they're you know, they're easy to spot up in the sky because it'll be this you know black and brown body, and then you've got that bright red head, right, of that just delightful skin tone right there. That uh, you know just kind of looks like angry and and scary. That's fantastic because in that absence of having big feathers right there, it means it can just shove its head like right into a carcass and, and just eat that delicious deadness uh, that's in there. And then when it pulls its head out, you can just kind of shake around uh, and and like all the little griblies will go flying off. And it's it's pretty clean, right? It helps prevent disease and just all around grossness and infection and and all of that. So that works, all right? And the idea with Darwinian evolution is that it's not that the bird immediately shows up in this way, but it's, we'll get into what natural selection is and how we're gonna have some birds that uh, look like this, and then some that look like the little sand bird and the water bird and all these different birds that we've seen thus far, right? So that's what we're doing. Same thing with the bill um, beak thing right here. You can see that curved, uh, nature of it that is great for just ripping flesh off of bone which is very different from like that water bird that we saw that had that little fishing bill so it can shove its head in the water and catch a fish and, and all that right very different things for the very different niches that these things are 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 doing right for the jobs that these different organisms have so that's another way to look at communities and and study this stuff now, food chains, these, like I said, we're going to talk a little more about because this is kind of easier to see. Uh, and, and there can also be overlap, right? Like technically, the niche of that vulture, it's also connected to the food chain itself, right? So some of the, these aren't like all perfect categories. There's going to be overlap. Overall, what we're looking for, connections, right, between these things. We're starting up the Batmobile, sorry. Uh, um, so, uh, let's see if it drives off. Let's see. Uh, I think if it's the car I'm thinking of, it's had a guy with a Viper before, but he just moved out, so he's gone. That was a loud one. Um, but then this guy, I think I think it's one of the weirdest look, like it's a, just a dumpy little Honda. Um, no offense to, to Honda, it's a perfectly fine automobile, but it's like, it's all primer uh, and just weird pieces stuck to it. Um, but it got an incredible muffler on there to make it sound like it's a tank. And he's gone. All right. I, I, and as I'm saying that, I really, I really hope that's not your car. Um, that, you, that you're not a, a student of mine and my neighbor, and I'm, I'm mocking you uh, here. Um, but say lovey. All right. That guy's gone. All right. So anyway, so food chains, what we're looking at here are, is the really how, how solar energy moves through an ecosystem okay so we tend to say food chain it's who eats whom or what or whatever but really with um with a food chain we're gonna we're, what we're gonna do is look at how solar energy enters that ecosystem and then moves through it okay so which can be an important distinction here but you know for our purposes if you're not an active you know ecologist or someone studying uh, this stuff, it's kind of all the same. Um, so don't get too hung up on it, but that's just, that's the idea. That's our definition, right? And so in looking at this, um, and this one cracks me, I love these pictures, these biology pictures, these ecology pictures that are made because they're so <laughs> simple to try to prove a point, but it's also funny just for the wolves, just stand like this buffalo should move, right? Like that, that's what I would think. Um, but it's the idea that we have the sun shining up here with that solar energy radiating down to the earth and it first enters this food chain through this plant so this dandelion that's right here or the grass or whatever right so that's going into the food chain the plant's going to convert that solar energy into food for itself and then what what's going to happen there is you're going to have an animal like this buffalo right here wander over and eat that plant right and is therefore taking that solar energy right it's because it's all this is all energy getting passed along in the form of food here but it starts out as this radiant solar energy right so we're tracing how it goes from here to here to here and then this very clueless buffalo 
uh, is going to be eaten by wolves. And so it goes to here. And then these guys, you know, they've had a good run, but they get old and tired and they die. And so they fall apart. And then as everything is dying here, it's going into these decomposers, things that are going to break stuff down, uh, you know, including this solar energy. And it's going to return back into the food chain. And so it's really, it's a cycle, right? It's the idea that nutrients will continue to get passed around and energy and all that and life is able to continue all right so that's the food chain idea now the problem is that nature is rarely this simple and straightforward right because what this implies is that like these guys only eat these guys these guys only eat these guys but like right here we've got grasses and we have you know flowers and weeds and other stuff they're going to be multiple food sources for multiple different organisms, right? Just think of your own diet. You don't eat one and only one thing. We eat a lot of different stuff, you know, throughout the day, right? So instead of a food chain, which can be useful, uh, and just so you know, you'll see a food chain, mainly, again, because it's simple. I'm going to give you a desert food chain on the final exam, and you're going to have to connect some of the stuff that I'm going to be talking about. And so that's why this is useful to, to uh, think about right now. And I'll break down these, these different terms, the producers and the, you know, consumers, um, which is what we would call these herbivores and carnivores. All these terms here I'm going to get into so you can make sense uh, of this stuff. Um, so we'll, you'll be tested on that simple concept. But um, what we really see out in nature is what we call a food web. Right, which is multiple interconnected food chains. So you can see this one way more complicated than the previous one we saw because you've got arrows and lines going everywhere to show that multiple things can eat this one thing and, and this one thing can have multiple different food sources and all of that. All right? So think like a spider web, multiple you know, interconnecting lines being woven through. That's what a food web is. And so this one, this is a uh, maritime or aquatic food web. We're looking at what's going on out in the ocean. And again, in a very simplified you know, model so we can make sense of it. But what we see, we have the phytoplankton here. These are plants, um, different kinds of plants than we think of here on land, but still taking in that solar energy. And then we have different, the zooplankton, um, the krill, these things eat the phytoplankton uh, and krill, which they, they bring up. I forget where I stole this from. Probably a book I use, or maybe the internet. I don't know. Um, but the krill, tiny little teeny tiny shrimp that you can see if you follow this orange line up here, everybody likes to eat krill, right? All sorts of stuff. Just likes to munch on that uh, krill. So seals and squid and fish and penguins and all, and all that stuff. You move up a little more. Um, you see that sperm whales, oh, they like to eat everything uh, down here. And then humans, we're on the top, baby, because we, uh, you thought sperm whales like to eat everything. No, we like to eat everything because, you know, that's that's what we do. That's how we humans work. If there is something moving in front of us, we'll kill it and eat it, right? That is, that's the kind of general we uh, of humanity. Um, but, yeah, we can eat anything that's that's fantastic like if you if you had penguin oh it's a little oily but not bad it's not i've never had it i i'm lying um to you but i swear to god if somebody said like hey you want this penguin steak or whatever um a penguin breast uh drumstick uh i would say god yeah i do yeah i didn't feel guilty because they're cute um but i still eat it right because that's how we humans work so we're up up here but then you can see this, what this one is showing, kind of the usefulness of this too, is you can see that if you follow this line down, it says factory ships, and then they're eating the krill. Now here's the deal. Do we humans eat krill? Of course not. I mean, we could, because again, we eat everything, but no. Oh, krill. Poor people food. No, nobody's going to eat that garbage. Garbage. No, instead what we do is we take the krill, we're going to eat it, um, but we take it, and we mash it up into this, this nutritious protein meal, and we feed it to chickens. Eh? And the chickens love it, and they get all good and fat and delicious, and then we kill the chickens, and we eat the chickens. Oh, oh, 
Now this I bring up um, because it's it, it's fascinating, um, really, and it just gets getting me hungry thinking about you know both chickens and penguin uh, and all that stuff. Um, but we'll get into this how, how humans can come in to an ecosystem and really screw it up. And you know our oceans. We'll talk about overfishing in a bit. But you you know you may have heard it's the idea that we can't um, you know keep taking fish in the same way from the oceans and and have it be sustainable and we need to be careful like if we're going to order fish at a restaurant or buy it at a grocery store or whatever we need to purchase the responsibly fished or farmed stuff right avoid this fish but you can't eat this fish and, and all that but what's really crazy and what we don't think about is you might say like well you know a i don't even like fish but b it's so complicated i'm not going to worry about it i'll just have chicken right make that easier and it turns out you're actually doing more damage um, to the oceans by having that chicken because of all the krill that's been pulled out to fatten up the chickens, right? Incredibly complicated, but that doesn't mean, you know, to give up. What, what it means is we need to, as we're trying to do good, so we're trying to use ecology and the study of ecosystems to help ensure that we're doing no harm to nature in general. If you're trying to do that, it simply means we can't be lazy about it right we can't take that easy way out what we need to do is really think about these connections and look to stuff like food webs and also see how you know modern industrial practices can also get into those food webs and screw them up right so that's the idea and i'm gonna i'm gonna get into how food webs work now but we'll revisit this and get back into this idea of how humans can, can mess with this stuff, can really screw it up, right? So we'll, we'll come back to that idea. But for now, we're going to look into is as these different players within a food web, okay, these different le uh, levels that exist. In fact, if we go back here, you see producer and primary consumer and secondary consumer, tertiary consumer, which technically here with humans, we'd be quaternary consumers if we're also eating sperm whales but i'll get into what this stuff means all right so that's what we're going to focus on here what's a producer what's a consumer what's a decomposer right and this is just so you know really easy to test on so just take notes on this stuff have these notes easy you know easily accessible and you'll be fine on the exam so a producer this is one who an organism that produces its own food okay uh, and these are plants. This is what we're what we're getting into are plants. We're going to be thinking about vascular plants for the most part in here, meaning things like like what we're looking at here, like this this oak tree, um, you know, taking in um, you know the sunlight and, and use photosynthesis, converting um, that stuff. Um, but it also it has roots uh, and the veins running through the leaves and stuff like that. That's what we mean by vascular as opposed to like algae and, and stuff like that right so a producer is something that's going to produce its own food and we also use the term autotroph auto meaning self and whenever you see trough or troph this t-r-o-p-h in a word uh i forget if that's that's latin or greek but it, it's the idea it means food it's referring to food stuff right so this literally means self feeder right it's it's not going out and getting some food it's making its own food and we can talk like we can say stuff like plant food right like you can buy at the, the hardware store or the nursery or whatever to make our plants healthier and, and happier but it's different i don't know what that i think there's a parade going on you guys hear that? i hope you guys can hear that and it's not just me sounding crazy Oh, they're collecting, they're collecting garbage cans next door. Good. We'll wait, we'll let that go. See, now a pro right now would just, would pause this, would stop it, would edit all this out. I ain't got time for that, right? Who's, who's got time for that? I gotta, I gotta bust these things out. All right, I think they got the garbage can. All right, so as I was saying, we can get plant food. No, they're gonna, they're gonna get another one. We'll, we'll wait.
Okay, good. All right. I think it's good. All right. So, so anyway, with the, the plant food, um, the idea is it's we put chemicals and things, these nutrients into the soil to aid the plant, but the actual food stuff, it's coming from photosynthesis. And don't worry, I'm not going to make you guys, this stuff is awful. Um, and it is boring uh, uh, level here. Um, but it's just the idea that it's making its own carbohydrates through this process within its own body. It's not going out and finding existing carbohydrates to then ingest. Okay? That's the idea. That's what we got going on with the producer. Pretty straightforward. All right. Now, the second level here, we get into the consumers. Okay? And with consumers, what we're dealing with uh, are any organisms that are eating other organisms. So they can eat producers, right? Go find those plants and eat those. Or they can eat other consumers that have eaten producers, right? So it's just something that's going out and finding food, right? Outside of its own body. It's not producing its own food. So we call these heterotrophs, meaning different feeder, right? Hopefully that makes sense. All right. So our first level, we have what are called primary consumers, okay? Uh, and these are herbivores, meaning they're the vegetarians of the ecosystem, right? The plant eaters, those things that are only eating plants. So this you know, gazelle or whatever the hell it is. Again, I have no idea what, what most of these things are. I just did a lot of Googling, grabbing some images, slapping them in here, right? Um, but this again, gazelle, I assume, uh, is what we call a primary consumer in that it's only eating the plants. So we also, of course, have carnivores, those things that are going to eat meat and only meat. Uh, so, you know, going to like this picture here, that's a cheetah. I don't know that much. I've watched enough Discovery Channel to, to know that. Uh, and that sounds like a gazelle, I think. Have you guys ever tried to pay? It? There's like 50 different things you know, like this with very distinct names, different species running throughout sub-Saharan Africa. So I don't know. It's all gazelle to me as far as I'm concerned. But the idea is this would be our primary consumer that it's eating the producers here, right? And then this would be a secondary consumer because he is going to eat this guy right here. All right, that's the, that's the idea. And then a tertiary consumer, and you can see like primary means one or first, secondary, right? Second, number two, tertiary means third. I mentioned quaternary before, that means fourth. It could technically keep going on, um, you know, up and up and up. It's just as, as far as you needed it to, right? So a tertiary consumer would be something that could eat primary consumers as well as secondary consumers, right? Like, I don't, I don't know if anything eats cheetahs but like if a lion uh wanted to eat the cheetah and you know eat the gazelle and all that the lion would then be called a tertiary consumer and quite often this is the top carnivore um or you know or just top uh consumer it's actually a better way um to say it because these things could also you know eat producers directly right uh and that's what an omnivore is so we've got herbivores are eating just plants. Uh, the, the carnivores are eating just meat. Omnivore means everything. It'll eat both producers as well as other consumers. And we humans, at least from a biological standpoint, fit into this category, right? We, our bodies are able to process both plants and meat, regardless of, of you know, if you're a vegetarian or not, right? Our bodies can handle it. Uh, and so we're like that. A lot of other primates are like this, as well as, you know, other stuff. And, and what's really cool is, is there's a connection. There's some kind of link between intelligence and an omnivorous diet. And I would imagine it has to do with just with our giant brains. And we need to bring in a lot of calories to be able to, to feed these, these thinking machines, right? Um, 
So having an omnivorous diet, being able to eat pretty much anything that's out there would be be helpful, right? Would be advantageous. Um, so that's why we see with all, like all these things right here, humans and primates like you know chimpanzee, ravens, those giant black birds we have all around the Antelope Valley, raccoons. These are brilliant, brilliant creatures. In fact, in the the book, um, in chapter what, eighteen, when we're we're getting into uh, this stuff, I have a link to a YouTube video of two ravens that I just watched for way too long um, somewhere. I, I forget exactly where I was, but I, I recorded. It was just they're brilliant in how one of them was was on the lookout, the other one was was on a trash can and like winding up the trash bag to pull it up closer like a little elevator to get the food scraps that were down in the bottom of the trash bag i mean it's just super intelligent creatures and wouldn't you know and also omnivorous right so that's uh, just omnivores in general are pretty cool okay and these could if they are hunting you know could for, like for us we can be considered a tertiary consumer at least a secondary consumer or whatever, right? Again, it depends on what kind of consumer are we eating, right? As we're as we're sitting down to eat, okay. Now, detrivore. This refers to detritus, which is a fancy way of saying waste, right? Garbage. Um, these are things that eat the garbage, like that vulture we got into earlier, right? So any you know once living, now dead animal remains, uh, fallen and decaying leaves, just waste products in general. Anything that eats this stuff is considered to be a detrivore. Okay, so vultures, these are crawfish that we're looking at here, these little freshwater, uh, uh, like little lobsters is, is what they are. They're feeding on waste stuff that winds up at the bottom of the river. Uh, so anything that's doing that, we call it a detrivore. And these are all the consumers that we've uh, we've got, right? They're all going to fit into some of these different categories. So just make sure you know the definitions of things like secondary consumer versus primary consumer and herbivore and detrivore and omnivore and, and those things. You know that stuff, you'll be fine. Uh, but we're not fully done. That's just for the, you know, the consumers. But then we have this category called decomposers. And so these are eating dead stuff, the waste stuff, the detritus, but they're doing it in a fundamentally different way. Okay? A detrivore, like technically we could be a detrivore if you're just, you know, walking around and you see some roadkill on the, the side of the road and you're like, oh, it looks delicious, and you eat it, um, you're a detrivore, right? Congratulations, and don't, um, or at least cook it uh, properly, but just to be safe, don't um, do that. But it really, if you're a detrivore, you're eating whatever food you're eating in the same way you would be if you were a carnivore, an herbivore, whatever, right? Putting it in your mouth, chewing it, swallowing it, all that stuff. A decomposer is actually breaking down this matter, breaking it down into its, you know, its fundamental components releasing these nutrients these specific chemicals and it's ingesting some of this stuff and then it's also releasing the other stuff back into that ecosystem back into that food chain or food web okay so we're talking about bacteria fungi these things that are they're just eating in a different way from how we would be eating something all right that's the that's the idea Okay, and so these are important, of course, because they're allowing this whole food chain, food web thing to continue on, right? Nutrients are being recycled back into the system, and then from there, producers can grow. These plants can grow, right? They can be ingested by consumers and so on, and the process just continues. Okay, so decomposers are a, an important component. And it's important to also realize they're, they're different. The reason why we don't call these consumers, yes, they're consuming other food, getting food different from, you know, what's produced in their own bodies. Um, but so they're, they're eating in a very different manner. 
All right, so that's that's the food web thing. Now, real briefly, I'm not going to dwell on this too much. Um, but just say with you know when it comes to these abiotic factors in an ecosystem, pretty much everything else we've talked about up until this point in the class affects the biosphere in some way. Okay, so like you name it. Well, okay, maybe not like latitude and longitude or that stuff. But like when we got into, you know, uh, the sun, obviously, uh, but getting into water and the atmosphere and climate and, you know, rock type and geomorphology, even, you know, like all of this different stuff we've covered up until this point, it all affects life in some way. Um, so whether it's things like, you know, obvious things like water is clearly an obvious factor. Everything needs water to live. Um, but it can also be like water quality can be an important component too. You can find water in the desert, um, but that water isn't always drinkable, right? It can be filled with salt and that gets into the alkaline nature of the soils and stuff that I've kind of touched on before. But yeah, it's really important to have, um, you know, the, the quality as well as the quantity when it comes to that. And that's all explained by both, you know, atmospheric stuff, climate stuff, um, just the hydrosphere in general, but it also gets into the soil type and the geology and the minerals and, and the lithosphere, right? Another lith uh, lithospheric thing um, that's important is stuff like the magnetic field, right? which we got into previously. I've, I've discussed it and it's generated inside the earth. In the outer core, this liquid metal is churning and it creates this magnetic field and we can use it for compasses to know which way is north and east and south and west. Uh, but animals can use this as well, right? Birds are able to use this to aid with migration. Um, sea turtles, in fact, uh, adorable. Um, they can, they are even more advanced. They effectively have, they don't just have a compass in their brains, they have like GPS. Um, cause they can get into like the, basically the strength of the magnetic field as they're moving around so they can effectively figure out latitude as well. Pretty remarkable stuff. Um, but that gets into just how basically everything that we've covered, all this abiotic stuff, it's also going to play a big role within these ecosystems. Okay. Now got into some of the kind of the key components. It's also important to look at the actual, like, what's going on in these communities, what's happening with these interactions, right? And so we have some here. I'm not going to get into all of this stuff, um, because there can be a lot, but there's some key things here. We either have competition, which we define as a negative interaction, or symbiosis, which we define as a positive interaction. And it's important to know that this is negative and positive. This isn't like me assigning value, right? This isn't like a morality um, thing here, what's good, what's bad. It's instead, it's looking at it from a scientific standpoint. Negative meaning there's a decline in something and positive meaning there's a growth, right? So negative is taking away, positive is increasing, right? So these forms of competition and examples I'll get into are predation and parasitism. Uh, like preda predation hunting, right? It's a negative interaction in the sense that if the hunter, the predator, is successful, it's going that means the removal of a member of this species, of this population in the ecosystem, right? Whereas with symbiosis, it's where things are, if not outright working together, they're at least doing no harm. And so things are able to grow, um, you know, amongst one another. And so you have survival, right? That's what we mean by positive interaction. So don't, don't think about it as like all predation is bad. No, it's actually, it's a good thing. Okay? So predation simply means when one species feeds on another. And that can be like that picture of the cheetah and the gazelle. Uh, it can be this more creepy picture the uh, uh, adorable spider uh, trying to get the little bug um, right there. It doesn't matter the, the size or what type of thing is doing it. It's simply when you have one 
organism is chasing out, hunting, capturing another to eat it, right? So as I said, it's negative in the sense that, you know, that poor little bug uh, isn't going to exist uh, if all goes well for the spider. Um, but it's a, a good thing, if you want to think about it, it's kind of fuzzy, um, in nature to assign these very human qualities of good and bad. But you can think of it as a good thing in the sense that it's actually very important for ecosystems to remain healthy, right? For predation to be taking place. And we'll get into like this concept of the gene pool in here, but that's something um, that, that's going on. I was watching uh, um, a terrible, terrible shark documentary thing with my kids. Um, I don't even remember the name or where I was watching it or whatever, but they, one of them, he's really into, into uh, marine biology and all that. I was thinking that might be what he, he does. He's really he's stressed about what he's going to do for a living. He's eight, um, but he's trying to figure out not only, you know, what is he going to do, but what kind of car is he going to drive? Those are the two biggest things that are, are pressing uh, right now. So we're watching a bunch of, you know, shark stuff and all that, as it's cool. But this one I got into in there, so how sharks are important because they're, when they're hunting, they're going after weaker and diseased fish or whatever. So they're, they're, you know, taking out those unhealthy specimens. And the idea is in killing those things, if these things are killed before they in turn reproduce and pass on their genes that make them more prone to disease and all that stuff, um, then, you know, the, the ocean itself is just a healthier ecosystem. Right? They're making sure that the, the prey species are all getting stronger and getting better and so on. And yeah, we see that. You know, there have been studies where you can just see that predation actually helps out with these future populations, okay? which sounds good. Now, what's, what's a problem, and where I always feel creepy when I start talking about it, is it's, there's, there's a, not, it's not too far um, from Nazism right, um, from eugenics and stuff like that, when we start applying it to humans. And I think it's important to be aware, and one thing that's never really discussed and it's just kind of left there, like all of this gene pool and predation and all of that, it's great for, um, you know, in ecosystems. It, it works. And I say great in just that it allows these things to function and on the whole survive. Clearly, it's a bad thing for the individual that is deemed weaker and easier to catch and is, is eaten, right? It becomes really problematic when we bring that over to human society. And that's not a thing like Darwin never did that. I mean, he looked at human evolution, but the idea of like how some people have used it to justify killing, you know, certain ethnic groups and, and races and, and all of that, that's not, that's not Darwinian evolution. That's, that's manipulating that stuff. And we humans actually, as I'll show, we, because we're so intelligent and because we have culture and societies and, and just, you know, civilization in general, we've managed to screw all of this stuff up, right? So just keep that in mind. Like all this stuff I'm getting into here, this is, we're talking spiders, we're talking sharks, we're talking stuff like that. As soon as you start talking about humans, it's a totally, totally different thing. All right, I'll, I'll get into that more, but I just want to make sure that's clear. Basically, I don't want to turn you all into little Nazis. You're welcome. That's that's my goal. Uh, I'm hoping to not make any Nazis as I talk about this. Um, hopefully that makes sense. And I'll talk more about some of this stuff. We'll also get into it with evolution stuff too next time. But if you have any questions, talk to me about it. I'll gladly clarify uh, any of that stuff. All right, so... Anyway, back to predation, whether it's sharks or spiders or whatever, this, this can be seen as a good, good way to ensure ecosystem health. Okay? Now this um, is a study from some other textbook. I held on to it um, because I think it's, it's just a good visualization of this concept. Um, predation is, is a, a good thing for ecosystem health. And what we're looking at here, this, this chart that's pretty easy to read, we're looking at this specific species of uh, deer. Um, this is in northern Arizona, I think is where this took place. Um, 
So we got this species of deer here uh, and the years right here. This is it's it's the numbers, how many exist in this specific ecosystem. And so it's growing and growing and growing. It peaks and then a sharp decline. And what we're looking at um, is this is when humans really start to move in to the area. I should say that was that was wrong. It's not humans moving into the area. It's a certain type of human moving into the area. I just, I just caught myself with that. Now, there are plenty of humans living here for millennia prior who were doing fine. Uh, it's when my people moved into the area, right? The pastier, whiter uh, folk started moving in uh, to this uh, part of the world. So you got white folks moving in, more sedentary lifestyle, bring livestock with them. So you know, their sheep or whatever, cattle coming in. When, when white folks move into an area in this situation, we want to eliminate any predators that exist. We don't like mountain lions or bears or whatever because they tend to eat our livestock, right? And then well, that sucks because we're, we're we're out of our food source or, you know, or how we get wool or, you know, whatever resources we're getting there. So the typical thing is whatever that predator is, coyotes, wolves, mountain lions, you name it, um, the people will go out and shoot these things, kill them, and we see those natural predators start to decline. All right, and that's great for sheep. What that also means is that the prey species, like the deer that we have right here, they just keep reproducing. They don't get the memo. They don't say, like, let's hold off on the babies because nobody's eating us. Uh, they just keep making babies, right? So that's what this is right here. The numbers just keep going up and up as what this is corresponding with. If we had another graph, we'd see if we had, like, you know, mountain lions or, or whatever the, the predator is in this area, we would see the inverse, right? Where the number would be up and then declining, right? On that chart, right? But these guys, nobody's eating the deer. So they just keep reproducing. They're not dying as quickly. So the numbers go up. And then this decline is actually the result of the deer start starving to death because there are too many of them and not enough plants for these things to just graze and be okay. So what happens is they just slowly, slowly starve and die. And that's where we start to see the numbers go down. And at a certain point in here too, what was uh, um, implemented was regulated hunting. In the absence of, of bringing back the natural predators, which most people don't want to do, like you hear, like here in California, we don't have grizzly bears anymore. We have them on our state flag and that's it, right? And every now and then you hear people say like, oh, we should bring the grizzly bear back. But it never goes anywhere, mainly because nobody wants to live next to a grizzly bear, right? They're terrifying, terrifying. They, they're, you know, black bears are scary enough. At least those are kind of sweet and all that. But a grizzly bear, this tough, bigger bear, we don't want that. Um, so, you know, nobody really wants to do that. Like, we like the idea. We're like, sure, let's put wolves up in Yellowstone, far away from me where they won't eat my children. Um, and I can see them if I'm driving through or whatever, um, but I don't want them here, right? So in the absence of bringing these natural predators back, we encourage humans to go out and hunt these things. And, and that's like going all the way back to the beginning of this, talking about putting little bands on ducks and encouraging people to go out and shoot ducks and all that. It's a way to regulate numbers so we don't have the starvation take place, right? And it's a thought. I mean, you can think, oh, you know, looking at this majestic beast, you know, how could anyone want to shoot it? And I get it. Like, I'm not a hunter. I don't look at that and go like, oh, I'd love to kill it. Um, but at the same time, if this thing is going to die, uh, either, you know, A, by a, you know, responsible hunter taking aim and killing it instantly, or it's going to slowly, over a period of like, you know, nine months, starve to death. Um, I think it's more humane. It's better for this thing to die in that quick way rather than just have it continue to, to you know, eat everything and, and slowly go, right? That's why we have hunting. And that's why we can say predation, why it's this negative interaction, meaning populations, numbers go down. It can be a good thing in that, you know, ecosystems remain in balance, right? And you can see how we humans, we start to mess with this stuff. We start to mess with the, uh, the, the communities themselves, the interactions themselves, and the balance 
in that ecosystem. Now, parasites, parasitism, I see nothing good um, from this at all. Uh, and this is simply where we have um, one organism isn't going out and hunting, but is instead attaching itself in some way for some duration to take resources from the host, right? Uh, and it may it may harm the host, it may eventually kill the host, but it's the idea that it's not, it's different from hunting. It's like a mosquito, lands on you, sucks your blood, that's a parasite. We're looking at here, the darker area, that's mistletoe um, in here, and mistletoe is a parasite, right? We tend to think of it as like the fun Christmas thing you smooch under, um, but it's a parasite. It's something that uh, attaches itself to another tree, to or to a tree, um, to a host, another plant, and it latches in there, and it uses the the tree's resources to live itself. And if you have too much mistletoe in a tree, um, then it's gonna it's gonna die, right? Because it's just not gonna be able to eat, right? It's not gonna get the the resources and all that stuff. It's not gonna be able to produce its own food, and therefore it's going to die. And I would I would not be surprised. I have no idea if this is true. My hypothesis um, would be the reason why mistletoe is a thing, you know, is gathered and used as a Christmas decoration, probably has something to do with trying to keep trees alive, right? Trying to remove this from trees, um, again, to keep ecosystems healthy and a way for humans to kind of interact with it. All right, and then finally, this whole symbiosis idea um, is where we, we have the positive interaction, where there's no harm being done. And the one I'm going to talk about is mutualism, which there are other types, but this is where, like we have with the bee and the flower, it's where each organism in this relationship both benefits and relies on the other for its continued survival. So it's the idea that the bee is going to land on the, the flower, on the plant, and it's going to get the nectar for food, but, you know, all the little, you know, hairs that are sticking off of the, the bee right here, that's going to catch pollen, and so when it flies to another flower to get some more nectar, it's going to cross-pollinate, and that's how the flowering plant can, in fact, reproduce, right? So not only is the plant benefiting and the bee benefiting, but actually they need each other. The bee needs the plant for food. The plant needs the bee for, you know, this ability to reproduce. That's mutualism. That's what we're getting at there. All right, hopefully that makes sense. That's pretty... Strafe. That's some pretty standard, like third grade science lesson stuff, right there. So don't, you know, that's that's it. Um, all right, now just want to I want to finish up with returning to this idea of how ecosystems are easily disrupted um, by outside forces, and we humans are like the outside force. I mean, it's important to realize that we also are a part of ecosystems, right? We're organisms, just like any other organisms here. And just the problem is we have this ability to radically change organisms. We do, you know, work, labor, and we get in and we actually dramatically alter nature. And we realized over the, you know, centuries and we've been studying this stuff that we humans, we can really screw up uh, ecosystems. Um, this bird uh, right here is an albatross, and I know that specifically because A, I googled albatross and I got the picture, um, but it was from another textbook. And this is how, you know, with a lot of this stuff is I started teaching this and reading textbooks that were already, like, already assigned or ones I, you know, tried to adopt or reviewed or whatever. Reading through, um, I realized I, I was fighting with some of them. And like this one was one, it was a fine book, but there were some of these things were like getting, it was getting into showing all these albatross nests and showing how many of them were empty. And it was connected to an increase in fishing off the coast of wherever, um, you know, Ecuador or something like that. Uh, and so it was showing how, you know, human activity can lead to the, the destruction of this ecosystem here, not because we're eating albatrosses or killing them or whatever, but because their food source, the fish in the ocean, that was going down and that was leading to less albatrosses that could survive, right? That's the idea. And that's all well and good. It's not 
I'm not saying that's totally wrong. I'm just saying with stuff like overfishing, it's so complex. And it's something where, you know, people really trying to, to figure this stuff out, trying to help nature, bless their hearts. We've seen time and time again that these ecologists aren't doing enough to work, to, to figure out every little thing that's going on, right? It's like overfishing. And when you hear that, I mean, just that term itself, overfishing, implies that you're fishing too much, right? You are taking more fish than you should. You are going over the responsible amount of fish to take out of the water, right? And we're talking about, we're not just talking about like people going out on the weekend, uh, you know, and throwing a, a line into the water. We're talking commercial fishing. So we're, we're tending to think about big ships going out with nets and stuff like that, taking fish. And so the idea is we don't have enough fish in the water that are maturing and able to reproduce and maintain our population numbers right? The amount of salmon or tuna or whatever it might be in that specific body of water, okay? But the thing to realize is that it's not simply these awful, you know, fishing boats that are going out and doing it. In some instances, we've seen the numbers of fish that have been um, caught have been lower than in the past, but we're still having this issue of declining numbers, right? So the fishing industry can try, and it's not to say that the fishing industry is always great. There are plenty of examples of, yeah, them doing the wrong thing and, you know, specific case studies and all that. But you've also had places where regulations are put into place and it doesn't really matter because of other stuff, right? Like the reason why the fish aren't surviving, it, it's not necessarily because of the fish being taken out. It's because of all the pollution being put into the water that's causing it to be disgusting and toxic and the fish aren't able to be healthy and survive and go on and reproduce right? Or, you know, eggs can't hatch or whatever. Same thing with like when we're dealing with um, rivers and estuaries and stuff on coastal areas, like any development, any logging, anytime where we're, you know, doing stuff to the land, that can lead to problems in the water. It can be a thing like removing trees near a body of water it can actually increase the temperature of water because we're, we're limiting shade that's in there. The river water goes up in temperature Maybe not anything we notice readily, um, but it's definitely something that affects, you know, fish being able to survive. Uh, we've had some like fish farms, okay, which is the idea. It's exactly what it sounds like, where we're trying to grow fish in a controlled, contained environment, still in the water, right? Um, and quite often these can be like on a river or a lake or whatever, where we have these nets and kind of we've made these pens where the fish that we're farming are living in there and we'll feed them and throw in some antibiotics and stuff like that to try to keep them healthy and uh, grow the fish and the problem with that is like it sounds good like we're trying to ensure that uh fish are growing in numbers um but it's it's uh um it's, it's just a recipe for disease number one and parasites and stuff like that some of these fish can be quite unhealthy if the conditions aren't right and it actually it turns out these fish never stay in one place a few are always going to escape for whatever reason and so now this diseased fish is going to hop out and, and swim away uh, and uh, um, infect wild populations and it spreads disease and again we have that issue All right so we've seen that where we go in and try to fix this stuff and we actually make it worse in some cases. Hatchery fish, it's another good example. I don't know if you've been to a fish hatchery before. Um, I have. My parents took me for some reason. I just remember this long, long ago. It's the most boring thing in the world. It's just, you know, some little concrete channels of water and you got some fish in there. Uh, and the whole idea with the hatchery fish thing is that you have fish eggs being hatched. You have little baby fish being born uh, and protected and kept, you know, safe in an area and then released when they're big enough to go out into the rivers and eventually to the ocean or whatever, depending on the, the species of fish, right? Again, it's the idea that, that we're trying to increase these numbers. 
but there's some concern that in doing this, we're actually we're putting garbage fish out there. We're, we're letting fish go out into the, the wild that shouldn't be out there in the first place. And that can be kind of weird to, to think about, but I, I like to use the analogy of, well, you, um, my Antelope Valley students, who I all love and adore. You're all very special to me. Uh, and I don't know um, what your plans are for transfer, if you are planning on transferring to a four-year university, where you want to go. I know at least a few of you want to go to USC. Bless your hearts. Um, and if that's you, you know, listen to me now. And if you're still on the fence, listen uh, as well. Don't do it. Don't. And I'm not saying that because I went to that other better college, you know, across the, the city on the, the western side. Um, also starts with a U. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, that's one reason. But it's also, I mean, I don't know if you guys know. I should tell you this. I don't know if you know the statistic. 97% of students who leave AVC and transfer down to USC, 97% are stabbed in the first week of classes. Do you know that? Did you, are you aware of that? I, I, I made that number up. Um, it's pro I don't know what the real number. It's probably closer to like 80%, but still, that's high, right? I assume. Look, the point, you see this in the news. It's actually... I'm making the joke out of it. It's actually kind of tragic how dangerous it is uh, around USC where you see people kidnapped and stabbed and, and all of that stuff. But really, it's we've got this idea of USC. Like everybody wants to go to it just because, I don't know, because they, they used to be good at football or, or whatever. It's just held up as this cool school here in Southern California. Great. Um, and so you want to go. But you guys, you my little Antelope Valley students, you're hatchery fish. Right, you've been protected up here in this soft, safe Antelope Valley. And I know what you're thinking. You're like, what, are you, what the hell are you talking about? The Antelope Valley isn't safe. It's not soft. I'm, I'm tough. I'm of the streets. No, no, we're, we're, we're safer and, and softer up here. It might not feel like it, but when you get to the big city, right, of, of Los Angeles, the ocean that is Los Angeles, like we're this little coastal inlet right here where, where you don't have to worry about the big sharks and all that. Yeah, you get some predators here, but it's not the same thing. You get down to USC, yeah, eaten immediately, right? Because you've been protected. You haven't learned the techniques. You haven't kind of fought for survival. That's the problem. Um, and that, you know, that we can apply that to the hatchery fish. They've been protected. They haven't had to learn how to evade predators and we also have from a genetic level and again it gets into that kind of oogie stuff but when we're dealing with fish it's okay but it's the idea that with some of these these uh um you know fish that are protected they might have been those weaker sicker ones that would have been eaten by predators early on but instead they're protected they're able to go off and reproduce and they pass along those genes right that genetic material okay because when you think about it fish don't have medicine and healthcare and ways technology to deal with you know setbacks and disease and stuff like that so when we're dealing with you know non-intelligent um species swimming around genetics it, it plays a big role right so the concern is that in protecting these things early they're going out and reproducing and actually harming the populations in the long run that's the that's the idea that we're dealing with so again the point being and you know back if you want to go to usc go for it um and honestly i used to make fun of it say like yeah if you want to you know spend a hundred thousand dollars for your first year of college great i think that's a great thing to do um but honestly the ucs and the csus have been jacking up their prices too that uh, there's not that much difference um in the cost anymore so hell go where you can go um just be careful with those loans right and try not to get stabbed uh, but the point, again, is when we humans go in and try to mess with this stuff, even if we're trying to do a, to the good stuff, we can cause problems. Okay? That's the idea. And food webs. My God. Oh, just look at that, that wonderful, delicious. I mean, look at that. Four billion calories of goodness right there. You don't see that out in nature, do you? No. Um... Food webs are incredibly efficient, meaning that it's been thousands, if not millions of years of 
of natural selection and adaptation and things have been worked out to the point where everything is efficient. Animals aren't burning excess calories. They're not going out for a jog, um, you know, to stay fit or whatever. No, they are, the only time they're running is to either, you know, catch something to eat it or to run away from something to avoid being eaten, right? Um, and that's because you, you're getting, you know, just enough to survive, okay? So nature is efficient, but efficiency sucks because um, it's hard and it's not fun. You know, you don't get, this is not an efficient meal, this giant burger concoction right there. So we humans, we went, we went oh, what is this? Right, and we figured out ways to enhance, to augment food webs, and just how we get our own food, how we interact with ecosystems. We have dramatically changed. And one of the greatest examples is how we fatten up cows and pigs and chickens and stuff like that. Like we grow plants, right? Not so we have to eat the plants. Whoa, who wants to eat a plant, right? We instead feed it to delicious cows or pigs, or whatever, so those cows will get fatter and more delicious, and then we eat them, right? We don't have to eat the plants. We get the delicious cow meat and beef, right? We, we get to do that, and other places do this. This isn't just an American thing, but we do it better, right? We are just incredible, and just how, how much food we grow to put into these animals so we can have more delicious animals. I mean, it's amazing. If you go around the world and you eat um, meat in other countries, like it, first off, you won't eat meat at the same rate at which you eat it here. Um, you know, if you're in most other countries around the world, because meat, it turns out, is expensive. We'll get into that. Um, but it, it also just, it just tastes different. Um, you know, it doesn't have that same, I don't know, fatty, delicious goodness. Um, that we have here, right? So we have really, oh, wow, we've perfected it, right? And so we have this concept of the confined animal feeding operation, or CAFO. Some people, liberals mainly, refer to this as a feedlot, um, which is an ugly, ugly term. Look, what I'm looking at here, this look, these are happy cows. Are you with me? I mean, look at that. Look how nice that is, where we just pack as many cows as possible these little cow condos, and they got the food right there. They don't even have to move at all, right? We've got this nice little bar here um, to make sure they don't unnecessarily raise their head up. They can just be nice and, and just mellow and eating their food. They can go to the bathroom, right? They can just live right here. They start to feel sick. We just, you know, pump some antibiotics into them. They're good, right? This is fantastic. So I don't want to hear... Um, you know, about it is, oh, they look miserable. No, that is great. It is your duty as an American to eat cow. Did you have some cow for breakfast this morning and for lunch and dinner? Maybe a little dessert cow um, and all that. That's that's what we should be doing. Yeah. So wait a second. I just did some research in between slides right here. It turns out, I mean, I'm not going to lie. Cows are delicious especially when you eat them for four meals a day now that, that part's fantastic and yeah i'm gonna say "Ooh, these guys look look, look happy <laughs> right, look at that delicious plant stuff that they're eating right here oh lucky cows um but it turns out this is incredibly inefficient okay in the, the sense that we put in a good 21 pounds of protein into a cow for every one pound it's going to produce right so we're effectively we're throwing away 20 pounds of protein we are literally burning and wasting food just to get that delicious hamburger or steak or you know whatever whatever it is we're eating right so it's it's inefficient it's a waste of food now again you know with efficiency it's fine we're not out of nature we can do this we can handle it the problem though is that with this is well it, you know wouldn't it be a problem if, you know, we didn't have as many people around the planets and, and all that, but we got a lot of people. You wonder how many people we got right now? It's like about seven and a half billion as I record this. this is, that's a lot, a lot of people, okay? Now, we here in this country, we got like 350 million. We got some space here, but, you know, it depends on where, like, 
where we have a lot of people, where we have you know a lot of people and all that. But here's the deal: we have a lot of people, which isn't actually that big a deal either. I'm actually very against this whole idea of overpopulation going to be the death of the world and and all that. No, we can hand the Earth can handle billions of humans. That's no biggie. The problem is what the Earth can't really handle um, is what humans are doing, right? Now, before we go back 50 years or whatever, we've got the United States. Yeah, we're wasting food like crazy. Like after World War II, oh, we're, we're fattening up our cows and we're eating them and we're doing all this stuff. Fantastic. We're, we're a tiny country, population-wise. And you got some people in Western Europe doing the same thing. A few key locations around the world, no big deal. But now, like, I don't know if you guys have heard. Have you heard of this place called China? Yeah, it's like another country somewhere. Um around the world and they have like a billion and a half people now for a while that was fine because they were all poor um and that's great because poor people by definition are vegetarians i mean that's just you gotta be um if you're not in this country i should say uh because we we subsidize our tax dollars go into making meat affordable it's like you almost can't you know eat meat um or can't not eat meat if you're poor in this country because of like a McDonald's dollar menu and, and that stuff, right? But in other countries around the world where they don't have this weird tax subsidy stuff, you know, poor populations aren't eating meat very much at all. But we're starting to see in a place like China, you have this middle class growing, you have people making more money. Many of them look to us here in this uh, country here as a way to like, well, what do I, now I got money, how am I gonna spend it? They're living in suburban neighborhoods, which is kind of a surreal, weird thing to see what, you know, what looks like an Antelope Valley suburban neighborhood over in China. Um, but also meat is a big thing, eating more meat with every meal. So now we're getting at a point where honestly we have more people who are wasting more food by having more meat-based diets. And we are getting concerned with this is unsustainable from a um, from a climate standpoint from the greenhouse gases that are produced and, and that kind of stuff, but also just in terms of like the food, right? That we were just throwing food away when we have a lot of hungry people that need to eat. Eating meat the way we do is not, it's not gonna work out. Now look, I'm not gonna lie. I'm not a vegetarian at all. I've, I have flirted with the idea here and there, but I always come back to sweet, you know, beef and pork and, and all that stuff. But I'm not, I'm not gonna give it up. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to give it up. Uh, and it's because I'm an old man. Uh, and when you're old, you're prejudiced. Right? And I don't mean easy there. Uh, don't cancel me. I, I don't mean prejudice like, like I don't like people who have different skin than I do or whatever. No, I just mean like I don't like new things. Right? You present something totally new to me. Um, uh, no, thank you. Right? Like this TikTok or, or whatever that you kids are into. No. No, don't want to even look at it, whatever. So like for me, going back to the race thing too, like I, you know, I don't care what color skin you have. Everybody's cool. Um, but if we suddenly have like a race of purple people show up, oh, I'd be so racist against the purple people because um, they're new, because it's different, because, oh, it's just so hard to deal with, right? So that's the stance I take with becoming a vegetarian. I ain't got time for that, right? I'm not going to do that. Um, so I'm... I'm not the one who needs to save the world. Now you, my my college students, um, you are the ones. Are you a vegetarian already? If you are, tune out. You're doing great, fantastic. And I know from past experience, none of you are um, at all. Maybe one of you are, but you, you only say that to kind of sound like a good person or whatever. No, listen, listen, you meat-eating monsters. You gotta stop. Right, because it's just it's it, we can't sustain this. We're gonna have starving people. We don't want to be like those deer in Arizona that slowly starve and die, and that's how we get our population numbers down. Right? We got to change our eating habits, how we affect these food webs and resources in general, and all that. Look, you're in college, baby. This is the perfect time to experiment, right? To figure out who you are. I mean, that's what. We do when we get to college. We experiment with everything. 
You, you guys know what I'm talking about. Yeah, you do all sorts of stuff. Oh, man, I never did this in high school. Oh, but now I do it. And now that I did it, yeah, it's not for me, but at least I tried it. You know, or, oh, this thing, ooh, yeah, this is who I am. Like, you know, you know what I'm getting into. All right, here, so fantastic. So while you're experimenting with this and that and this, why not experiment with a salad, right, instead of that hamburger or whatever? Yeah. Oh, you think of what I'm thinking? Yeah, why not become a vegetarian? Are you with me? No, you're not. None of you are going, because you're all monsters. You're all selfish little monsters. But it's the deal. We got to stop doing this if we want to survive. If we want the earth, I mean, there, there's going to be fine. It's going to be a ball of rockets here for a while. If we want the earth as we know it, if we want the nice earth that we, we like to think of, if we want nature in the way that we think of it, we got to we gotta go easy. Easier on the, the meat. If not, do full. I would just go full vegetarian. Why even mess around with it, right? Now, look, I'm not going to do it. And I didn't want to do this, but I, I do have kids. And you could say, well, like, why don't you just look, teach your kids to be vegetarian? You know, that generation can save the world or whatever. No, I'm not going to make multiple meals. Um, you know, one with a steak for me and, and lettuce for the kids or whatever nonsense now they're gonna eat me too because they're my sweethearts but i mean these are my children do you have children i'm gonna assume not um i don't really care i'm just you know I, i'm so disgusted that you won't even become a vegetarian um okay okay here here if you're over the age of uh, 35 um you can keep eating meat okay but if you're under the age of 35 you gotta change that's what i'm saying i'll, I'll bring that up but still look i got i got kids have I mentioned this? I have kids. So sweet. They're, really, they're the future. Um, here, it's so brilliant. One little angels. All four of them. Yeah, I have four kids. I um, like just say I, I wanted I wanted two. My wife wanted three. We have four. Um, if you need details about how this all works, um, send me an email. Um, yeah, it, it's what happens. Just uh, just be careful, kids. Let me tell you. Uh, and, and you could say, like, maybe the reason we're running out of food is because you keep having children. Um, look, shut up. Um, life happens. Uh, but these kids could grow up and really, really help the world, but only if they have enough food to grow. Are you with me? Do you want to murder my children? Is that why? Yeah. You, watching this lecture, listening to me speaking right now as you're, you're biting into a big hamburger. Or Just keep in mind, with every bite you take, it's another child you've murdered. Yeah. So you're with me now? You're going to be a vegetarian? Are you? You're not. You God, monsters. All right. Look, you know what? Go ahead and eat the meat. I don't care because you're also going to die too. Um, and that's something actually that is a legitimate concern. And one of those things where you see these scientific studies and it should make us all pause. Um, but yeah, it turns out if you, the more meat you're eating, you know, and, we're, and what we're really talking about, we're not getting into like, you know, healthier balanced stuff where you're, yeah, you're eating meat, but you're also eating this other stuff. But it's like we do here, where if we don't have, you know, a pound of beef or pork or whatever mixed in with something, we, we don't, you know, feel right. Yeah, that's taking years off our own lives for a variety of reasons. But one issue, something to think about, is this idea of biological amplification, okay? which means you have, with these food chains, you'll have chemicals that remain stable within fatty tissues, which means meat, right? Um, that kind of remain stable and also get passed along. Just like solar energy, we can see these chemicals get passed along. And it's the idea that as you move further and further up that direct food chain, you're going to have more of these chemicals concentrated in that organism. And so what we're really getting into here is stuff like pesticides, which, hey, hey, they're perfectly safe. All right, completely harmless. Um, don't you worry. Uh, I mean, and that's why we we put uh, the people who work with them in these spacesuits um, right here. Doesn't that look safe and, and harmless? Um, yeah. Uh, so we spray that, and it is, to be honest, a lot of these the way it's studied, it is safe and harmless when it's initially applied to stuff. When we put it on you know, plants. The problem, though, is that we're not only eating that one kind of 
plant, right, or only having that in small doses or whatever, we're spraying this stuff on plants that will be eaten by other things. And so what this image is showing is that the little orange dots in here, that's whatever pesticide X that we're dealing with. It's sprayed and dispersed all over these plants, like we see here. But as stuff comes in and eats the plants, it gets concentrated, right? Because chances are you're not just eating that one tiny little plant, you're eating multiple stuff. And if you're a bigger organism like a cow, you're going to eat a lot of these plants to just survive. And so you're going to get more of the stuff concentrated into your fatty tissue, into the meat. And then anything that eats the cow, it's going to be concentrated there and so on, right? So go ahead, keep eating meat. Um, you know, let my kids die. Uh, it'll be fine because, ha, huh, joke's on you. I'll have the last laugh. Um, you're going to be dead too. Oh, oh. And I know what you're thinking. You're, you're saying, there's got to be a way around it. I can still eat meat. Yeah, there is. Organic. You can just buy organic meat, which is so incredibly uh, affordable. I think a pound of organic hamburger is like $10,000. Um, right, so affordable. Yeah, that's, you know, it's very easy to eat healthily and, and live long in this, in this country as long as you are a millionaire, um, right? Which I'm guessing, college students, you're not, right? So I would just, I would just give up on this stuff. Unless you're like me, where you can be really choosy, because I am loaded, let me tell you. Uh, unless you're like me and you can be choosy with this stuff, the meat's not worth it, right? Like what I do, just so you guys know, what I do is I actually meet every single cow that I'm going to eat. Like this picture was taken right here, me checking out the cow, making sure it was clean, free of chemicals and all that. And then shortly after this was taken, uh, I, I punched the cow to death right there. And then me and my four little children, we just descended on it like a pack of wolves and we're just, you know, tearing into its stomach and eating it. And oh, it was oh, delicious. So we're going to be fine. Don't worry. But for the rest of you, maybe give up that meat, right? Just save the world. You with me? You're not with me. God, monsters. All right, fine. All right, that's all I'm talking about today. I'm, I'm disgusted uh, by all of you. So we're done here for today. Um, next time, we'll get into evolution. As I said before, regardless of your thoughts on, on, on evolution and its merits and all that, stick with it. Listen to that stuff. Um, yeah, I have that open mind. Because we'll, we'll cover some stuff that isn't necessarily covered in other classes where you, you've heard about this before. All right? All right, have a lovely day. You monsters.